This is the fifth part of the interpretation of The Psychology of Money, let's continue. Morgan Housel's book The Psychology of Money talks a lot about investment, but reading such books doesn't necessarily mean you have to invest. I believe most people studying investments are simply wasting their time, it's better to delve into something else with the energy. We discuss investments to ponder more general and universal principles. The advantage of discussing investments is the abundance of data, you can present some solid arguments. In this part and the next, we'll talk about something much more important than investing, and that is how to view history. Chinese people love to say, learn from history. In the past, people either read classics or history. Just like playing chess requires studying openings, and business schools teach cases, we hope to draw lessons from history. People believe that history always repeats itself, after all, there's a saying, there is nothing new under the sun, and there is another quote, often attributed to Churchill, that goes, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But is it really so? Does history always repeat itself? If history is indeed learnable, then why is there a quote, purportedly from Hegel, saying, the only thing that we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history? Not learning from history condemns one to repeat it. Yet, those who learn from history are doomed to helplessly watch others repeat it. If history always repeats, why is it so challenging to draw lessons? Some might argue that historical repetitions are not simple duplications, the patterns remain the same, but the specific parameters change, just like Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. But even this is not accurate. Many events may feel familiar, but the truly transformative historical events that change the course of humanity are not written in the same rhyme. History is determined by unexpected events. For example, let's look at the recent transformative events that changed the course of humanity. The Great Depression. World War II. The Atomic Bomb. Antibiotics. The Internet. These events are fundamental historical events. Other things, such as how the U.S. economy grew after the war or how Chinese internet companies became global leaders in the 21st century, derive from these fundamental events. Studying history requires grasping these fundamental events, and these events are shaped by accidents. These events do not rhyme with anything that happened before, you cannot predict them, and you might not even imagine them. History does have some patterns, but there are three rules in history that determine it won't repeat. The first rule is that each era has structural progress. Structural progress means that something is not only novel, but also brings systematic changes to the world. Take the atomic bomb, for instance. It's not just about inventing a new weapon or a new type of bomb, it's about the moment this weapon is introduced, fundamentally rewriting not only the way humans conduct warfare, but also questioning whether there will be wars between superpowers. Similarly, antibiotics are not just inventing a new drug, they completely rewrite the entire healthcare system, instantly raising the average life expectancy by several decades. These major technological breakthroughs have absolute unpredictability because science is not obligated to provide these things to humanity. People in the past didn't know about atomic bombs and antibiotics, and we don't know what will happen in the future. Events like these cannot be found by studying the 24 histories, could the ancients have known about them by studying history? No, they couldn't. These are new things under the sun. Not just in technology, human production methods, social structures, cultural customs, including human personality, are constantly undergoing structural changes. Read Joseph Henrik's The Weirdest People in the World, and you'll find that Western individualism didn't exist since ancient times. It evolved over millennia. Read Zhang Hongjie's Evolutionary History of Chinese National Character, and you'll see that the Chinese personality and the Chinese way of doing things have been changing over the past two to three thousand years. The experiences of the Warring States period do not apply to the Han Dynasty. The lessons of the Tang Dynasty cannot guide the Ming Dynasty. The rules of the Qing Dynasty's officialdom are not the same as modern China. The second rule is that people can actually learn lessons from history, and precisely because people learn from history, history won't repeat itself. Let's look at the graph, it's not a barcode, it represents economic recessions in the U.S. history. 
Each black line represents an economic recession, the thickness of the line indicates the duration of the recession, and the space between the lines represents the time of normal economic growth. The big picture of this graph is not a repetition of history but progress in history. The overall trend is that economic recessions are becoming less frequent and their duration is getting shorter. At the end of the 19th century, the U.S. essentially experienced a recession every two years. It was just like what we learned in middle school textbooks, economic crises are the inherent contradictions and internal flaws of capitalism and are absolutely unavoidable, occurring every few years. But starting from the early 20th century, economic recessions occurred every five years. After 1950, it became every eight years. The last economic recession in the U.S. began at the end of 2007, and as of 2019, 12 years have passed without another recession. If not for the COVID-19 pandemic, there might not have been a recession in 2020. It can be said that the U.S. has just experienced the longest continuous economic growth since the Civil War. Why did the economic cycle change? Does this mean that capitalism no longer has contradictions and flaws? Housel says that there may be two reasons for this. One is the change in economic structure. In the past, the U.S. relied heavily on manufacturing, which easily led to overcapacity, and it's well known that economic crises are mainly caused by overcapacity in capitalist economies. But now, the U.S. relies mainly on the service industry, which is less likely to experience overcapacity issues. However, this explanation doesn't account for why China has not experienced an economic crisis. Perhaps another reason is more influential, that people have summarized historical lessons, learned to avoid, or at least delay economic recessions, and learned how to quickly recover from economic downturns. People invented this thing, called the central bank, and the earliest central bank was the Federal Reserve. Central banks can use monetary policy, and governments can use fiscal policy to regulate the economy. Both of these methods are visible interventions in the economy. History has proven that using these methods to regulate economic cycles works. So, people are not incapable of learning from history, people just cannot always learn from a particular segment of history. This group of people learned, and the next segment of history won't be the same. The third rule is that history has the effect of a chain reaction, so essentially, it's unpredictable. How did the Great Depression of the 1930s happen in the U.S.? I've seen two explanations, both involving a chain reaction. One explanation is that technological advancements led to the Great Depression. We've read Arnold Kling's Specialization and Trade, and he probably represents the mainstream view. At that time, things like engines became popular, allowing a significant amount of work, especially in American agriculture, to be mechanized. This sudden industrialization led to mass unemployment. Unemployment caused a decrease in purchasing power across society. The decrease in purchasing power led to a crisis of surplus. The surplus crisis led to the Great Depression. Another explanation, perhaps a bit unconventional, is from the former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke's 2004 book, The Great Depression. Bernanke says that originally, various European currencies were pegged to the British pound. However, due to World War I, various countries lost confidence in the pound. To instill confidence in their national currency, countries around the world adopted the gold standard. Once on the gold standard, governments had to find ways to hoard gold. To keep gold from being exchanged, countries reduced currency issuance. This led to deflation. An economic common sense is that deflation is much more terrible than inflation. During deflation, the amount of circulating funds in the market greatly decreases, businesses can't get funding, and operations come to a halt. Thus, it resulted in the Great Depression. These two explanations are entirely different, but both involve a feedback loop. The significant historical events that have a profound impact always have positive and negative feedback processes, including the one from the Great Depression to World War II, which is also a feedback loop but feedback loops are fragile. If, for various reasons, one link doesn't happen in the middle, the final situation will be completely different. Housel also gives an example. Why has student loan debt in the U.S. surged now? It may be because of the 9-11 event. 
The chain reaction is as follows. The 9-11 event in 2001 caused a contraction in the U.S. aviation industry, resulting in a small-scale economic recession. In order to stimulate the economy, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates. With lower interest rates, loans became easier, so everyone started buying houses frantically, leading to a housing bubble. The housing bubble resulted in the 2008 financial crisis. The financial crisis caused a contraction in the job market. People found it difficult to find jobs, so they all went to college. The demand for college education increased, and student loans increased significantly. Student loans have now become a serious problem for the U.S. economy. Of course, this is a very rough explanation, but the chain exists. Now, do you think that at the moment the 9-11 happened, you could have predicted that 20 years later, Americans would be troubled by student loans? If you've studied enough history, you might be able to speculate on each event in the chain before it happens. But you absolutely dare not predict which event will definitely happen. With so many things forming a chain, it becomes completely unpredictable. History has structural progress, and each era is new. People change history after learning from it, making the previous lesson ineffective. The chain of historical events is full of contingency. So, how can history repeat, and how can we predict the future from history? The belief that history has an inevitable direction, with various rules that are bound to happen, historicism, is an incorrect view of history. In 2017, Daniel Kahneman gave a speech. He said people are accustomed to, when encountering an unexpected event, not managing it properly and blaming themselves for making mistakes. They say they must learn from this and not make the same mistake next time. This attitude is wrong. This event is purely unexpected, why talk about correcting it next time? Kahneman says what you should really learn is that this world is hard to predict, it is always surprising. In fact, the quote from Hegel mentioned earlier is misunderstood. Hegel's meaning is not to complain about how people don't learn from history properly. It is to say that people simply cannot copy historical lessons. The quote is from Hegel's Philosophy of History, and his original words are, Each period is involved in such peculiar circumstances, exhibits a condition of things so strictly idiosyncratic, that its conduct must be regulated by considerations connected with itself and itself alone. Amid the pressure of great events, a general principle gives no help. It is useless to revert to similar circumstances in the past. The pallid shades of memory struggle in vain with the life and freedom of the present. So, in this case, what's the use of understanding history? This question is significant, it is not just a matter of historical perspective, but also a question of whether reading is useful, whether experience is useful, and whether learning anything is useful. In the next part, we'll discuss how to draw lessons from history. In particular, We'll talk about what Buffett calls value investing and what practical benefits it can bring to you. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.